So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to, um, to uh, Dr. Johnson. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Dr. Johnson can bring up his screen and he's got some comments to make. And then we will have uh, Dr. Mayo come on to do the uh, final uh, closing comments. And then I'll have just a couple of comments to add to that. So Eric, I'm gonna turn it over to you and appreciate you joining us for this part of the program. Okay, welcome to this final session of the uh, acetabular fracture course produced by um, AO North America. This is the final session of the last session. And I've been asked to give a talk um, on some of the aspects of acetabular fracture surgery historically, an introduction of uh, how Emil Luternel um, performed his operations, what he was like, where he had to live. And then I'm going to sort of morph this into some career challenges and try to give you an explanation why Emile Letourneau became Emile Letourneau and the struggles that he had to get through. So Emile Letourneau is seen here uh, both on the right image in the operating room and uh, at the celebration of his 1000th acetabular fracture um, uh, accomplishment in Paris. And you can see some of the other members of his group that studied with him. Uh, and I think uh, just to take this uh, picture on the right and just kind of imagine you're in the operating room with this individual. Uh, he was excited on every time he got to the operating room. It was a challenge to him and he enjoyed his work. Contributions of Luternel are many, and they're not all listed here. He reported the first series of 75 cases in 1961, developed the ileo-inguinal approach in 1965, developed the extended ileofemoral approach, wrote three textbooks, began the first pelvic educational course in Paris in 1984, continued to teach until the last month before he was diagnosed with cancer, and he died August 14th, 1994. He had the oldest and the first database of fractures and he would spend hours each week updating this database so it was accurate. He established a passion and a camaraderie for acetabular surgery, established the first pelvic referral center, developed the first instrumentation set of implants and instruments, and his classification uh, which is in that uh, in his main book has lasted the test of time and it is still the world's gold standard. Percentage of his good and excellent results under 14 days are listed here by diagnosis at the bottom. And you can see the excellence of his technique with 95% in transverse and both column and posterior column fractures. Uh, even the T fractures were a high percentage of excellent results. And then, on, and then continuing down, he averaged over 80% good to excellent results in his series. And this was uh, verified by Mattis series later in the 2000 uh, generation of series reported. Uh, and they all are at least greater than 80% good to excellent results under 14 days. We had a classic symposium uh, as I was the guest editor in CORE clinical orthopedics related research, August, 1994. Uh, we brought out his first uh, article on his first study of, a, of his 75 cases. It was a eulogy to him. Unfortunately, he died just before this book was published and he never really got to see the journal. So back in Emile's career, uh, I think this is part of how uh, Emile developed into who he was at the end of his life. He was born in a small island, uh, St. Pierre et Miquillon, over here just south of Nova Scotia. This is in the North Atlantic Sea, off North America. This is Province Francais. This is French territory. And he grew up, I was born on this small island. He, Montreal uh, is over here on the left, the St. Lawrence Seaway is through here. And we'll go through a little bit of his life. And you can see the struggles that he had to overcome to get to the point where he was. Some early images of Emile, kind of a handsome little boy. You can see the type of stereo system that he had at the time. 
Here he is at, I think, I believe, a, a Catholic church um, uh, uh, meeting uh, and an award uh, for his um, uh, achievements. He's got his double-breasted suit, which he seemed to wear throughout his youth. And here he is uh, a little bit later growing up. You can see uh, the harsh conditions that he was surrounded by in his life on this island was basically fishing, boat repair, uh, and the construction. So he wanted something better for his life. And in doing his genealogy, I found out from um, the son of a mother that was his classmate that he would spend Saturdays walking with his red wagon and his hammer and his chisel to his uncle's garage and house to learn carpentry. So he was adept at surgical experience. This is uh, Langolade on the left. This is the uh, section of uh, St. Pierre, uh, the isthmus and where people uh, live. This is a harsh, harsh environment. And you can see him, he wasn't uh, overly developed in the upper extremities at this time, but he was, uh, he was a great guy and very chiseled face and very handsome. So in doing his genealogy, his family uh, was the Luternel family and his mother's family was Pichon. And they were from Manche, France, which is uh, near Normandy, Northwest France. And this picture here is a satellite view of the island where he grew up. This blue periwinkle house is his home. At age 17, he took a boat, Cap Bleu, to uh, Montreal on the 28th of July, 1944, in order to go by himself across the Atlantic during the end of the war to get to Paris to learn his education. He subsequently got to Paris, uh, and in Paris you can go to medical school, it's like going to college, but you don't become a doctor until you do your residency. So he had finished his schooling, he wanted to do orthopedics, he went to speak with Robert Jude. Uh, and the interview was short with Jude. He, Jude, when he talked to Jude, he had no letters of recommendation. He had no family presence in Paris. He had no money. They had no family money. And Jude said, I don't have a position for you. And as Emile was leaving his uh, room and shutting the door, uh, Jude asked him where he was from. He says, I'm from St. Pierre. <clears throat> and Jude said, you start tomorrow. And because of that relationship, he then went on to form his uh, Lutonel School of Acetabular Surgery and trained quite a few people <clears throat> on his techniques. So there's a difference between these two people. The one on the left is a young man <clears throat> trying to get ahead and trying to make a better life. The older, the person on the right is an established Parisian surgeon, very famous family uh, and well-to-do. So there it's a struggle for Emile to achieve his greatness, and that part of it is what made him what he was. So this is his house in St. Pierre. It's being torn down. Uh, they subsequently built a secondary school there with his name as the title of the school. So he's quite famous on this island, and I've run into uh, quite a few contacts through emails about his life and how he grew up. So his accomplishments, pelvic classification, pioneered the concept of pelvic and acetabular fracture center, brought acetabular surgery to the world. He was, however, also excelled in social life. He was a bon vivant. He loved his band de Letournel, and he was a great friend and a mentor. A couple of pictures from Caesar's Palace a few years back where he would be uh, excited to get his picture taken with some of the waitresses, and he was just on top of the world. He, he lived his social life like he lived his, his life in the operating room. He was known for golden hands. This photograph got him in trouble. This was published in Le Figaro, the yellow newspaper of France. It was published because of Emile's success and Emile would take care of the Formula One drivers. And the Formula One drivers knew the French Michelin chefs. And he started then taking care of the families of the Michelin chefs. And it would be no problem for him to call up on a Friday or a Saturday night at 6.30 and get the best table in town at the best restaurant for as many people as he had in his entourage. So, but the 
French surgeons were a little bit upset that he, he got such advertisement in the paper and that increased his animosity amongst them because he was so successful, he was so famous and they weren't. So he had an incredibly strong personality. He never was afraid of any surgical case. He would not accept average. And he always made his best effort, effort to fix the fractures correctly. So why did he have this personality? I think I've got some answers. His personality was special. He would never ever quit or be defeated. He would never accept mediocrity. And he had one thing else. He had a generosity of his spirit. He was a joy to be around. So I'm trying to maybe give an explanation where this generosity of his spirit and the qualities of his surgical technique came from. This is a video taken in 1992, I believe, in Den Haag, the Netherlands, at a pelvic and acetabular fracture course. He had just gotten off the plane and arrived at the start of the meeting. And he's giving a talk on normal radiology of the acetabulum. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I'm able to speak in my own language. And as usual, I have to tell you English. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me and also an honor to be in your company. And uh, I hope that uh, we will have today's work interesting. And um, anyway, for me, it will be, let's say again, a great pleasure to try to transmit to you what I have learned during 30 years of acetabular and pelvic surgery. And I like always to remind that I was the assistant of Robert Fidel for more than 20 years, and uh, he asked me to work on the subject in the late 50s, and uh, I am still working on it. I don't know if I learned everything, something, everything, but I must confess that uh, yesterday I had operated a case which he believed in my surgery, so it gives me some courage to carry on the work. The two columns are broken. The anterior column, which extends from the anterior border of the iliac crest up to the pubic angle, has two parts, upper, middle, and inferior ones. And the posterior column is linked to the other one a little above its midpoint. The posterior column is massive and more um, adapted, we should say, to external, to internal fixation devices. This second video uh, is a video that was found by Michelle Ronsky, an uh, orthopedic surgeon from Rome, who spent time with Emil uh, after uh, the group of us did. And he was, happened to be at the French Embassy in Paris one afternoon and was getting some things taken care of. And he saw on a pile of film, an old film, um, the name Letournelle, and he asked the uh, consulate if he could take the film and he did. And they said, sure, we're going to throw it away. So these are films 1969 in French. I'll just show a short portion of it, of Emil describing his discoveries about the excuse me, acetabular fracture classification, um, the mechanisms of injury, and a little bit on his fixation techniques. So this is 402 cases, 36, 360 have been operated on. Les fractures du cotyl sont en réalité des fractures des massifs osseux qui circonscrivent la cavité cotyloïde. Le cotyl 
est situé dans la concavité d'une arche ayant pour clé de voûte le toit du cotil et que limite deux colonnes. La colonne antérieure, ici représentée en blanc, oblique en avant et en dedans, elle est grêle et de relief tourmenté. La colonne postérieure, ici peinte en rouge, est volumineuse, solide et verticale. Pour étudier une fracture du cotil, il faut quatre clichés. Le cliché de face du bassin, qui dépiste les lésions bilatérales. Le cliché de face de la hanche, sur lequel nous étudions systématiquement six éléments. Le détroit supérieur, la ligne radiologique ilio-ischiatique, expression de la tangence des rayons aux 4 5 e postérieurs de la surface quadrilatère, lu cotyloïdien, les bords antérieurs et postérieurs du cotyl, le toit du cotyl. Les obliques à 45 degrés sont obtenus avec un rayon normal tombant sur un bassin dont l'axe transversal est oblique à 45 degrés par rapport à la table. Pour l'oblique obturatrice, c'est la hanche blessée qui est surélevée. Elle permet l'étude de la colonne antérieure, du bord postérieur du cotyle, du cadre obturateur, de la région suscotyloïdienne externe. Pour l'oblique à l'air, c'est la hanche saine qui est surélevée. Elle permet l'étude du bord postérieur de l'ociliac, du bord antérieur du cotyle, de la totalité de l'aile et de la crête iliaque. So why was Emilio so involved and so unique among surgeons uh, of our current time? He had strong principles. He grew up in a very difficult area of the, the world. He was forced to take care of all varieties of orthopedic disease. He had no help. He was in a uh, workman's compensation hospital in the south of Paris, and here is the world's best surgeon. But he, had, he was forced to be the end of the line referral center for this hospital in this area. So his surgical skills came from managing his surgical storms. So I wanna bring in another concept here, Julius Wolff, and we all know as orthopedic surgeons, we know Wolff's Law. But I think Wolff's Law may have an application to the human personality uh, as we go through this a little bit uh, and try to compare a meal to uh, his maturation from the storms he had to encounter in his career. Julius Wolff was a German anatomist and a surgeon, died in 1902, worked at Friedrich Wilhelms Universität in Berlin, student of Bernard von Langenbeck. He came up with his magnum opus, 19, excuse me, 1892, that bone will adapt to the load applied to it. And the reason for that is the bone is protecting itself and it, it makes itself stronger for the next load. So Julius Wolff on the left, his uh, law of bone transformation in the middle. And this is a book full of calculus. He was a very uh, technical uh, mathematician and he spent his career trying to figure out this law. So if we take Wolff's law and compare it in nature, this is a dramatic comparison between two types of trees. The tree on the left, is an ancient bristlecone pine tree. It's only found in one spot in the entire world. It can live to 4,000 plus years old, and it lives at the top of a mountain. The storms hit the top of the mountain more than they do the sides. The trees on the right are aspen trees and aspen grove in the Ashley National Forest, Utah, United States. They're never at the top of the mountain. They're always in groups and they're very flexible. They never take any brunt of a storm. So there's a comparison here of Wolf's Law in nature between load and what load can do. And for the aspen tree, if they're subjected to load, they fracture. They don't have any previous history of remodeling to load as Wolf's Law, and they can't manage heavy storms. They get destroyed. In contrast, the bristlecone pine lives because of the storms. They go to 4,000 plus years old. They survive at 10,000 feet. 
The roots are in shale rock and alkaline soil. Nothing else grows there. It's an old lake bed. The tectonic plates and earthquakes push these mountains to 10,000 feet. There's limited water. They endure 40 centuries of storms. They grow one inch a year in girth every hundred years, sorry, one inch every hundred years in girth. They survive because of Wolf's Law. The trees that find better water and good, better soil grow fat and die early. The trees that find the worst possible spot to put their roots survive the longest. So the bristle cone pines adapt to storms. They're located here. This little uh, red dot here is on the central part of the White Mountains on the eastern border of um, California and Nevada. San Francisco would be directly to the ocean side over here, Los Angeles down here. This is a um, schematic from Google Earth showing you where these pine trees are located. It's a 24 mile ride up the mountain from Highway 395 on this red dotted line to this one grove. These are the White Mountains on the right, the Sierras are at the bottom. This is the Owens Valley and this is Highway 395, one of the better driving routes in the United States if you like cars. But to get up to these mountains, it's almost like you're going to a temple. These trees are massive. They're twisted. They have, the front part of them is usually dead from the previous centuries. The trunks are distorted and they have very broad bases and they survive because of the storm. The ball, a very small pine cone on the left is about an inch to an inch and a half and it can produce these enormous trees. So there's a key here uh, and I think it applies to the humans. You can see how these trees are desolated. Nothing else grows up here. And these trees have managed to survive millennia because of certain principles. And you can see what the storms do to the wood. It twists the wood and torques it, but the trees get bigger and wider bases and they get stronger because of the storm. So adaptation to stress, trees at the tops of mountains. This is the classic example of Wolf's Law in nature. So Luttrell's book published in 1982 was a storm to orthopedics basically brought up a topic that nobody knew very much about. In the AO manual at the same time, there were a few pages dedicated to wall fractures, and I think a posterior column or a posterior or transverse fracture. That was it. They had some small plates on it. There was nothing else. Emil compiled his work and published it. It, uh, it had all the answers. It was difficult reading at first because of the terminology and the concepts and the three-dimensional mind to kind of understand these pelvic problems. But comparing the book to the clinical cases uh, began to make sense. It was another storm and it changed orthopedics. So a day routine for Emil was up at 5 a.m., four espressos before surgery, change in the office, secretary's present, off to the OR running two rooms frequently, at lunchtime a bottle of red wine with the team back to the theater till six if the cases went well champagne at 6 30 and then singing uh, about uh, eight o'clock at night until 1 a.m with the chefs in a local restaurant he was a bon vivant he loved life this is his hospital on the left this is one of my original slides uh, this was a workman's compensation hospital it wasn't the premier hospital in paris it was in a small place of paris in the south part but look at Emil on the right. Look at the smile on his face. He was going to experience his passion another time. He was ready to go. Very short guy, a little bit broad, but immensely talented, immensely strong, and nothing could stop him. Nothing. This is his hospital from the ground level. Uh, not very impressive. And the metro stop uh, here, the hospital is down here with the turquoise top. And the metro stop, I think, was uh, on this side of the intersection up here. So very small, isolated place, but he became the best in the world. So there's a, a principle here of Wolf's Law, and I think it's Wolf's Law in the human condition and the human personality that created someone like Emil. Emil would not die. He could not be pushed over. He fought back on every opportunity to gain strength and, and uh, technique skills. So here we are, 
the tree and Emil. There's a difference between here. Emil's alive and can talk. Emil had one other quality, had generosity of his spirit. He was an amazing person to be around. He was always fun to be with, and he lived his life to the fullest. He would work in his office between cases. He would work at nights, on the weekends. And when he was at work, he was at work. But when he was out on the town, he was the bon vivant. He was the center of attention and everybody enjoyed Emile Letourneau. So Emile in surgical stress, these are his storms, like the tree has storms on the uh, bristlecone pines. He weathered them all. He learned from the mistakes. You don't learn from doing something easy and you have a good result. You never learn anything from that. You only learn from your mistakes or the difficult case. So he would make mistakes, he would figure out how not to make them again, and then he got better. He made himself stronger. So in the end, a difficult case to Emil was just another storm. He'd done it before, it wasn't a big deal, and he was more interested in where he was gonna have lunch, despite the fact the case was difficult. So Wolf's Law, I think, applies to humans. Bones react to load, humans react to stress. If we're successful in managing our storms, then we get stronger and our skills get better. So that's the key, managing your storms. So there's also one thing that you will find uh, in certain people in orthopedics. If you look at the history of orthopedics, there's individuals who by themselves pushed the envelope and made things change. And Lemiel did this, but Emile had a quality that I have not seen in very many people, and that was his generosity of his spirit. And if you are at this AO course and you are interested in AO surgery and AO trauma or AO subspecialty, you should make every effort to affiliate yourself with your regional or your country's AO organization. They will accept you. It's an open fraternity, sorority. It's camaraderie. We do things without being paid for. We enjoy the company of other surgeons. We learn from other surgeons. We develop contacts with international people. And I can email or text any one of my friends in a picture and an image. And, and within a four or five hour period, I'll get an answer back no matter where they are in the world. And it's because of the organization of the AO. It is unique in the world. There's nothing else as fantastic as the AO Foundation. So bristlecone pines survive because the storms push the bristlecone to the edge. And when it does that, it makes resin. Resin protects the wood. The wood cannot be destroyed. There are no natural hosts at 10,000 feet to decay the wood. It's wind and sand and ice storm erosion is the only destruction of the wood. The resin, we do the same thing with our surgical cases. The resin from our difficult cases and we're successful makes us stronger. So you increase your resin with your difficult cases. So the application of Wolf's Law to surgeons and to, um, to you guys who are gonna be AO surgeons is to dedicate yourself to excellence, technique, become the best of the best. Education above the competition, weather your storms, recognize the patriarchs who got you where you were or are, become a bristlecone pine to younger surgeons, encourage them, have generosity of spirit, make them feel welcome and increase the resin of your character. So examples to sum this up, Julius Wolf's Law on the left, the natural tree example of Wolf's Law and Emile Letourneau is the human example of Wolf's Law. So in my 30 years, this is what I've learned. I hope it, I've learned some more, but this is what I've got on my slide. Difficult cases change the surgeon and challenge them. You learn from your mistakes. They are the teaching points of your career. Restore axis length alignment of fractures. Use compression and loading of fixation whenever possible. Get advice. Be gentle as possible with the soft tissues. Survive your discouragements. Don't quit. Don't, don't go into something else. Stick it out. You'll survive. Complex surgery is a career learning curve. Mistakes are made early and less frequently throughout your ex curve experience. You learn from those storms. Never give up. You can get through the storms and you're an example of Wolf's Law. You also need to do another thing is develop a passion for what you do. 
the surgeons that have given their talks this past uh, session starting in July have a passion. When they go to work, they're not working. They're, they're enjoying their passion and their challenge. So your career should be a passion, not just work. Make sure that that's prioritized in your future goals. Career storms change you. So you'll become stronger as your career matures and you'll become more experienced and you'll get more gratification and satisfaction from the surgery and the teaching that you do. So the question then is what will you become uh, now in this early part of your career and as you look forward to what you're gonna do? Uh, and my suggestion is you take this example of Wolf's Law and try to apply it to your, the rest of your careers. You also need uh, a career that um, never stops learning. You always try to learn new techniques. Change is part of life, and those who don't change are left behind. So when change warrants a change, then you should accept it. Develop a group of friends that you can conspire with and get consults from, and get career colleagues. You can do this uh, through the AO very easily, and you'll become internationally connected to people who are doing the same things that you do, the same interests, and education is also something you should strive to, uh, to take part in, try to educate people, try to make a change in surgical care of patients. So just in a summary, um, my request of you is to make contributions to patient care. Make contributions to science if you're in an academic center or if you have the uh, desire to do that. Constantly teach new techniques, learn the new techniques, become experienced with them. And with this kind of combination of things, you should be able to advance the care of your patients to the best possible care available. But also remember the generosity of your spirit. You should have one. And when you're in a teaching situation or an interaction situation, you be responsive, exciting, try to teach them something that's new and to help them along in their careers to mature. Thank you very much. Yeah.